Good morning. Welcome back to this fifth exposition through Mark's Gospel. Today we'll be looking at Mark 3, 7 to 35, which is the second part of the section that we started last week on Thursday from Mark 2, 18. And our focus for these two expositions is people's response to Jesus. Now it is estimated that more than a third of the world's population, and indeed more than 80% of Kenyans, would call themselves Christians. Looking at those numbers, you could say, indeed the gospel has gone out to all the worlds, and maybe that's why the modern church has been a bit more relaxed in fulfilling the Great Commission. But you and I know there are still many within that statistic that are only Christians by name. A better comparison, perhaps, is the 1.1 billion fans of the football club Manchester United. This statistic ranges from those who merely subscribe to the team because of the name to those who are diehard fans. Such a fan base is commendable for a football team, but Christianity demands more than popularity. In our passage today, we'll see that Jesus is not at all interested in fans. Instead, he has come to make disciples. And in this match, there are only two teams those inside his kingdom and those outside in the kingdom of Satan. Guess where the Pharisees and even his own family belong? I'm telling you, prepare to be amazed. But first, let us begin with a prayer. Dear Lord, like the psalmist, we seek that your word be a lamp for our feet and, our li and a light on our path. We pray that your word would dwell so richly in us that it would overflow in all that we are and all that we do. Please cause us to be those who don't merely subscribe to our faith by name, but that our lives speak of you wherever we are and in all we do. Please use the meditations of my heart on your word to strengthen, grow, and rebuke us to be faithful disciples before we can call ourselves good gospel workers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me read then the passage for us, reading Mark 3, uh, 7 to 35 from the NIV. Mark 3, 7 to 35. We are told, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the rick, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. When they heard about all he was doing, many came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he too told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with the diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zerot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Well, his, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem, saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. 
than he could plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God. Praise be to him. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is part two of the section that we started last week, focusing on how people respond to Jesus. We saw that even when everything points us to the true identity of Jesus as Lord, who is worth our worship, men will not always respond as you would expect. The problem we realized isn't merely evidence, but the condition of people's hearts. Looking at the outside, people look innocent and maybe even religious, but Jesus sees their heart. In our passage today, uh, we look at other responses that may seem at first positive and even perhaps admirable to us. But Mark will remind us that unlike fellow man, Jesus isn't after making a name for himself. We'll survey this through two teaching points. Number one, Jesus has come to make disciples, not fans. Jesus has come to make disciples, not fans. Number two, he is here to rob the kingdom of Satan. He is here to rob the kingdom of Satan. Let's begin with the first point. Jesus has come to make disciples, not fans. On our assignment, I asked you to try come up with a structure on this passage and uh, give you a hint to look at how the different groups respond to Jesus. Now, if you're a good student and actually did the work, then you'd come up with something like this. Uh, looking at 7 to 12 there, uh, you find large crowds that are following Jesus because of all the miracles that he's doing. So it starts with very large crowds. In 13 to 18, we have Jesus going up on a mountain and calling his own disciples to himself. He sort of selects his own disciples. So crowds, then disciples. From 20 to 22 there, we see Jesus' family and the Pharisees. Uh, and surprisingly, these guys think that Jesus is mad or he actually has a demon. Then we move back and we see Jesus contrasted with Satan in 23 to 30. And we're told that Jesus is the strong man, more powerful than Satan, and that those who reject him commit the unforgivable sin. Then finally, uh, 31 to 35, again we come back uh, and this time we are told that Jesus' family aren't simply those who are related by blood, but that they are actually those who do God's will. Okay? They are those who are on Jesus' side, who listen to him. Now, you, you could simply group these responses into two. Uh, there are those who are with Jesus, namely the disciples, who have left everything to follow him and do his will, and he's called them to be with him so that he can send them out. And then there are those who are outside. You know, these are the crowds who are simply following him to see a miracle. Or worse, they are like the Pharisees and his own family who outrightly have rejected him, thinking that he is crazy. You would think that most Jews, uh, and as a matter of fact, the teachers of the law, or at least his own family would be on his side. I mean, these guys have seen him fulfill what the Old Testament prophesied. His own family know of his special bad circumstances. But that isn't enough to make them his disciples. If anything, it seems to have pushed them even further. Of course, later we know that his own Martha Mary and at least two of his brothers, uh, James and Jude, would be part of his faithful followers in the end, as we learn from early church history. But what Mark wants us to see here is that entry to Jesus' kingdom isn't based on descent or race. As he says at the end of Mark 3, 
looking at those seated in a circle around him, uh, that is his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Because whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. It's those who come to him not simply as fans or for his miracles, but to listen to him and to do his will that are his true family. Think about it. If Jesus won't show favoritism to his own family and the, his own race uh, to get to heaven, where does that leave those of us who tend to think they can manipulate God uh, with their works or their own church attendance? How many times do you hear people say or imply that Jesus won't judge them because they are good people or better than most who may even go to church regularly and give to the poor? Sometimes we can even feel like such people don't need to hear the gospel. But Jesus would have us know he has nothing to do with funds and everything to do with making disciples. Some will stand on that day and say they had Christian names or they gave to church harambees or they never said anything ill about Jesus and, and Christian. Perhaps they even fought for the rights of those persecuted for their faith. They built Christian organizations. But at the end of the day, the question will be, did you listen to the gospel call and turned to be a follower or were you just a fan? I think this should awaken us to realize just how many people are still enriched by the gospel, even in our own churches, even in this Christian country. It makes the preaching of the gospel so urgent, even when you have a Christian majority. But looking closely, we realize there's something more at play here than simply making up one's mind to follow Jesus. There's a war going on. There's a crash of kingdoms to set men free, which takes us then to our second and last point. Jesus is here to rob the kingdom of Satan. Jesus is here to rob the kingdom of Satan. Now, if you go back to the comparison that I gave at the beginning between Christianity's popularity with Manchester United, it sounds like it's all left on someone's preference. And you might say, well, I'm, I'm more of a Nasana fan, you know. And I think I actually admire Islam. I think, I think I prefer it to Christianity. But as we'll see here, in this match, there really are only two teams. You are either in with Jesus or you are outside in Satan's kingdom. What is worse, we are told that actually everyone starts outside until Jesus rescues them and brings them into his own kingdom. So then what we'll do from now is narrow down to that passage uh, uh, that we have that teaching that is quite at the very heart of all this in uh, verse 23 to 30. Now, by this point, uh, many people have been following Jesus because of all the miracles that he's doing. He's no longer someone that the Pharisees can ignore, regardless of what they may actually think about him. Remember how 36 ended with them plotting to kill him. So what do they do? They resort instead to damage his reputation, saying that he is casting out demons by the power of the chief demon, Belzebul. Imagine that. How outrageous is that? They can no longer stop people following him. So they say that this man is an agent of Satan. I want you to see just how serious that allegation is. That the son of God, the Christ, is nothing more than a witch doctor. That's how far these guys have fallen. But Jesus doesn't fall down to their level or follow them in calling names. Instead, he uses that to teach them what is actually going on here. First, he says, their argument doesn't hold any water. Because as you see in verse 23, he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? I mean, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. What he is saying, in other words, is that Satan would have to be foolish to be driving out his demons. It's like opening a shop and chasing away customers or scoring into your own goal. I mean, it doesn't make sense at all. Instead, what this guy should be seeing is that someone more powerful than Satan has come. That's why demons can't stand him. 
Jesus is far more powerful than even the hidden, uh, that even the hidden spiritual powers are exposed at his coming. They can no longer hide. What is happening here should actually be making people believe more in him. But as I said, there is a war going on here. When the gospel is proclaimed, a kingdom is attacked. Jesus is calling out men from the kingdom of Satan into his own kingdom. On the surface, it looks like you know, a question of simply uh, knowing that he is the Christ and you know, gathering all the facts and without a doubt you know, following him. But in truth, it is only those Jesus has robbed or rescued from the kingdom of Satan that actually come to him. There is not a single man who comes to him without a spiritual warfare happening in the heavenly realms. But you also know that Jesus is the stronger man. So this war really isn't on equal ground. He is far more powerful than Satan. And for everyone who believes and answers the gospel call, Jesus has the power to rescue them from the grasp of Satan. And those who come to him become his close family members, regardless of their former sins or where they are coming from, uh, whether they be Jews or Gentiles. On the other hand, those who reject him, even if they be as religious as the Pharisees or are related to him by blood as his own family, they remain in the kingdom of Satan. He can save anyone and everyone, but will show no favoritism to no one. At this point, you might be asking, what do we do with that unforgivable sin then, as we see it in verse 28? Let me read it for us. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every sin that they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Now, I remember growing up as a young Christian, really scared at one point, wondering if at some point I had actually committed this sin. You know, that I had done the one thing that would guarantee health for me, regardless of anything else I did. I think I would actually say yes and no. But let me explain. If you look closely at this passage, the problem is that these Pharisees have rejected Jesus and gone to the extreme of, uh, of calling the work of God, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, as being Satan's mission. In other words, they have heard Jesus and his gospel and they rejected him. The problem isn't so much what they now call Jesus, but the state of their hearts in response to Jesus and his gospel. The gospel has been made plain to them, but they said no to the work of God and blasphemed instead the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's therefore nothing that can be done for them because they don't want any they don't want to be saved lately. In 21, we see Jesus saying that every sin and slander can be forgiven. And I know we have heard people say very vulgar things about Jesus and our faith, but Jesus says. All sins, including killing Jesus, as we see at the end of the book, can and will be forgiven. But if someone rejects this gospel message, he rejects the work of the Holy Spirit, the very mission of Jesus, which is the only hope for salvation. So the unforgivable, the unforgivable sin then will be rejecting the Holy Spirit's work by rejecting the gospel. In truth, we have all at one time been there. Some of us, perhaps for longer than others, rejecting to come to Jesus. But praise God for the stronger man who rescued us from our hard-heartedness and from the kingdom of Satan to bring us into his own family. In conclusion, I would say, this should cause us great joy to be in Jesus' family, but also I hope it see, helps us to see how hopeless this world is under Satan without the gospel and without the work of the Holy Spirit. On one hand, we rejoice that you and I are members of God's own family because Jesus has robbed us from the kingdom of Satan. That we can call him God, that we can call him 
our dad and we can call each other brother and sisters in Christ all because of what Jesus did for us by dying at the cross to rescue us from sin and the devil. But we should also uh, really value the place of prayer as we seek to reach others with the gospel. I mean, as we saw last week, the heart won't simply be won by evidence or miracles. And this week we realize it gets even worse. We are told Satan has held people captive. He has held our unbelieving friends, our neighbors and family members, and only Jesus can set them free. I hope we may be known not only by our grasp of the Bible message, but as evangelical Christians for our prayerfulness, knowing that only Jesus can save people. On one hand, we preach the gospel, but let us also remember to cry to God because we realize it is only through him, it is only through the work of the Spirit that people can be drawn and saved from the kingdom of Satan. Why don't we finish there by, by prayer? Reading from Ephesians 2 verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Heavenly Father, we praise you for rescuing us from our hard-heartedness and snatching us from the grasp of Satan. We who were once dead in sin and following the world under Satan have now been set free and brought into your family. We praise you, Lord, that we can call you Father and Lord, that we have a guaranteed entry into your kingdom as we have found refuge in King Jesus. We weep and cry to you to show mercy to our friends and family members who do not know you, those who live under the shackles of Satan in their unbelief. Please open their blind eyes and their ears to the message of the gospel. Create in them a hunger for your word. Spoil whatever idols hold them captive, if that is what will take to save their souls. Have mercy, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.